questions posed uh, by Abdul Majid. Um, there's a huge potential. There are also incredible challenges, and you've walked us through quite a bit of that. We've been talking about this agenda for decades now, and it goes back to Kwame Nkrumah, it goes back to Julius Nyerere. This is not new to Africa. Why is this the moment that we can make this happen, truly transform the situation in the continent? And what do the different stakeholders need to do for this to be the time we really make a difference, please? Well, thank you very much. And let me, let me thank all of um, the heads of states who are, who are with us for this very important uh, discussion. Um, and of course, thank His Excellency, uh, the President of Ghana and the Government of Ghana for the facilities. Uh, we, I think you are correct that the task has evaded us and the continent for too long, since May 1963, when the uh, organization of African unity was established in the historic city of Addis Ababa. I do believe that there have been significant successes, particularly if you look at the objectives of the, the OAU, um, the political unification of the continent, pushing back on uh, the colonialists, and with the defeat of apartheid in South Africa, that objective was met. What remains is the economic integration of our continent. Today, as we speak, there are 47 countries that have ratified the agreement establishing the AFCFTA. Unprecedented political will and political commitment. Uh, and that is why in less than five years, we've made so much progress because of the demonstrable political will. The topic today is absolutely critical because if we do not unlock opportunities in agriculture, create jobs, uh, feed Africa, we will not succeed as a continent. No country in the world has developed without the agricultural sector uh, as a pillar of growth. If you take, for example, China, uh, when people ask, me, well, why do you think from the point of view of trade liberalization of agriculture, how will you be able to include smallholder farmers on a continental value chain? Well, China was able to do it in less than one generation, uh, bringing over 700 million farmers, smallholder farmers, as part of a, a value chain of agriculture to feed uh, that country. So I believe that with the political will that exists, uh, that we have a very unique opportunity to position agriculture, agro-processing, as the driver uh, of food security in Africa, job creation, uh, and ensuring that our continent is globally competitive. Uh, the, the, the opportunity, I believe, will not come again. <clears throat> If we miss this particular chance, um, it's difficult to see if we get another chance. Okay, I, I, I'm going to come back to you in a short while with the question, what are the biggest roadblocks right now? But, but allow me, Your Excellency Desalen, to come to you now. In the Ethiopia experience, there's so much to learn from the journey that Ethiopia has gone on when it comes to agriculture. When you look at this, the potential to really unlock transformation through this um, Africa continental free trade area, let me know, what are your thoughts? What are the learnings we can take from the Ethiopia experience? Um, thank you very much, uh, moderator. I think I just want to begin with the hopes and a positive note, uh, because in most cases, um, when we talk about African uh, transformation, we talk about many negative things uh, which hinder our potential to unleash our mindset. So I think uh, there are many positive things that has to be looked into in our continent. I have been to rural Ghana uh, two years ago. I have seen a huge transformation that's taking place in 
rice production in Ghana. I also went to, before the coup, to uh, Burkina Faso. And there has been uh, one million uh, metric ton of rice production program, uh, which uh, an organization, AGRA, which I chair, is supporting. And that was also a very good example, not only in Ethiopia, but in Northern Africa, in Tunisia, in Egypt, in uh, Morocco, we have best practices everywhere. You can go to Southern Africa, I can mention a lot. So I think there are lots of best practices that can be scaled up in our continent. And my own country's example, you mentioned, we have uh, agricultural commercialization cluster approach, which a new technology and adaptation of you know, new technologies. We have a number of technologies uh, that are on the shelf by our research and development organizations, which has not been utilized. So I think we don't need to go somewhere else, but you, we have a breeding, uh, you know, Western Africa breeding institute here in Ghana, which is doing a remarkable job. The whole thing is summed up. Uh, we can say that the problem with us is we are not, you know, coming together and learning from lessons to bring about productive capacity in our countries. So I think we need to invest in agriculture as the basis for every development. There is none other continent who has moved into the next ladder of economic development without dealing on agriculture first. So we need to engage, our policies has to you know, be uh, good enough to make agriculture our priority. And now most African countries are doing that. It's an opportunity. But the most important thing is we are exposed by the shocks, global shocks we have seen now, uh, the mega trends that are going on. You know, the pandemic, the you know, Ukraine-Russia uh, conflict, and the climate change, all those things mentioned every time, now and again, uh, are shocks that have exposed our food and agricultural system that it is vulnerable and it is broken. So we have to make the whole food system, the whole value chain to work. So trade is important. AFCFTA is one of the landmark decisions our leaders have taken and it should be implemented with that good spirit, with a political leadership and goodwill. Uh, so that's important. And I think, um, so the most important is therefore we have to address our deficits, especially in infrastructure deficit. We have to invest in. We have to call with a NEPAD, you know, a new, uh, you know, African initiative for partnership. Our partners shouldn't come for food aid. They should support us to come up with production and increase our productive capacity. You can see billions and billions of dollars are invested in food aid and emergency and all kinds of things. And people are waiting for emergency to come and to support billions of dollars rather than investing in our productive capacity. So I think we have to make sure that our, we are engaging with our partners in terms of having you know, such kind of uh, engagement where they have to do that. Now the African Union and uh, the US partnership, which I co-chair, uh, is working on how to address our infrastructure deficit, rather than on food and security, I mean emergency supplies that has been there for years. If you remember back in 1964, uh, the global uh, institution said we have to end hunger in 1963. But after 80 years, we are still talking about ending hunger. So we have to invest in agriculture and invest in a, in a such a way that it, it interconnects and intra-trade is given due attention. And I think this is where we can move. And there are best practices everywhere in our continent that has to be emulated.
Thank you for that. It's great to hear that you see the examples in many places across Africa of best practice of changes happening um, in terms of the development world. As, as the MasterCard Foundation, we really are trying to work in many of these spaces to enable you know, um, local decision-making solutions, build capacity, but also to ensure that um, our partnerships are respectful and action-oriented and really embedded in the needs of the African continent. I'm gonna come more to that in a moment. But President Ole Seguno Basanjo, let me come to you, Your Excellency. Um, and just really um, jump into it from several perspectives, a, a leadership perspective uh, from where you sit today, but also you have farmed yourself. You have been a farmer. And so I know you've had your hands on the ground, you know, so share with us. He's a farmer. He is, yes, and still is. Wonderful, wonderful. Share with us. Um, where are we now and where would you like to see us going? What needs to be done to get us there? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we are, as uh, Prime Minister, as Miriam said, we are on the way, but we are not there yet. One of the things that I even see on our topic is we are talking of agriculture. I believe we should stop talking of agriculture. We should be talking of agribusiness. When you talk of agribusiness, you take everything together. Agriculture was what we were given by the colonial, not agribusiness. Agribusiness takes the whole value chain from land preparation, from equipment, even for land preparation, up to the food on the table. And that is what we should now be talking about. I, I will not want to continue to remain in producing crops or product that we have to go to Europe to add value and brought back here. Mm -hmm. Take cocoa. We in West Africa and Central Africa produce more than 75% of cocoa in the world. And some people will say to us, Oh, we in Africa cannot trade among ourselves in a Greek business because we produce the same thing. But they in Europe produce the same thing and they trade among themselves. Why can't we here? Ghana produces cocoa. Ghana's cocoa has to go to Switzerland, to Germany, before it's turned to chocolate. Kenya does not produce cocoa, but they eat chocolate. South Africa does not produce cocoa, but they eat chocolate. Mm -hmm. Why can't the cocoa we produce in Ghana and in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire be turned to chocolate and be sent to uh, Kenya, to Tanzania, mm -hmm. to South Africa without going to Switzerland? Now, that is where my talk about, or my idea about agribusiness uh, comes in. Now that is one point. Another point is when we talk about agribusiness, we bring everybody into the uh, uh, stage of play. When you talk of agriculture, you are talking in silo. But when you talk of our big agri business, you are bringing all the ministries, all the departments, all the agencies together. Because you cannot talk of agri business without talking of finance. You cannot talk of agri business without talking of uh, in industry, industry. You cannot talk of agri business without talking of trade, which we are talking about. Uh, but when you talk of agriculture, you tend to leave it to Ministry of Agriculture. And yet, Ministry of Agriculture is very important, but so is Ministry of Finance. And that brings me to the point about financing agribusiness. Um, we, I love when we talk about agribusiness and funding 
of financing. In my own country, if you go to the commercial bank to take loan for agriculture, you will be lucky if you get the rate of 20%. With the rate of 20% for a Greek loan or a Greek business loan, you have to be producing cocaine to be able to make profit. Now, that is the truth. You, you have to be producing cocaine to make profit. Now, it, it is ridiculous to extreme to say that you are promoting agriculture and you expect your farmers to go and get loan at the rate of anything more than single digit. Mm. They will not be able to make it. Mm. And that is the truth. Now, even when you go to our big um, African Development Bank, the time they take before I was trying to get loan from one Were of them. Were you struggling? Yes. Really? Yes. <laughs> I was trying to get loan from one of them. It took me f six years. Wow. Now, wow. I, I remember President Nana saying, I think here once, that look, he waited and he waited for too long to get loan from one of them. Now, if you have to wait for six years, what is the term of a president or a prime minister? <laughs> Four to five years. Now he has waited and his time has come and gone. <laughs> He's still waiting. Now, we, we, what are we going to do about this? We have to do something about it. Yes. Um, so what the infrastructure has been talk, talked about. But I believe that there are a number of small areas where we can do a little bit better than we are doing. I believe that if we have thriving coastal shipping system, maybe from Cairo on the east to the Cape, on the west from Algiers uh, through West Africa to the Cape, mm -hmm. we will increase our intra-African trade by at least 10%. And we don't need much to be able to achieve that. On one occasion, I went to uh, Angola, and I said, look, what can Nigeria uh, trade with uh, Angola on? And it's one little thing, which they call indomi in Nigeria. Yes. This is a um, thing that is like spaghetti. And it's no noodles? Noodles, yes. noodles. And children love it. Even some adults love it as well. <laughs> <clears throat> and, and this is what Angola wants from Nigeria. Mm. But you cannot take that by air. Mm. And then I decided to look for, well, the coastal shipping. <laughs> I couldn't get I went to Calabar, and they said the ships that I can get are smuggling ships. Now, I would not want to use smuggling ship to try and do trading. Mm. Uh, but but th 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 this is the sort of thing. And in the area of coastal shipping, uh, we don't need much. Mm. And it can be done. And maybe it should be done. One last point that I want to make is the point about division of labor. Shouldn't we now be talking of regional division of labor? Here in West Africa, we produce cocoa. We can produce more rice. We can produce cassava. In East Africa, I was in uh, Ethiopia. I went around with the prime minister. After Ukraine and uh, COVID, Ethiopia has decided to be self-sufficient in wheat and to be a net exporter. And they will do it. And the Horn of Africa can produce wheat for the rest of us in Africa. Why don't we say, Horn of Africa, you do that. Pay attention to that. We in, uh, in the Lake region, you do, we love... Uh, dried uh, tilapia. 
you produce fish for us mm. and smoked uh, sun dry and that will be something and we can trade in it in the rest of Africa. Um, uh, South Africa can produce beef and milk and wine, uh, red and, and white. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, but what I'm saying is that isn't that a possibility and something that we can pay attention to mm -hmm. regional uh, uh, division of labor in agribusiness right. and to help us. Now, they won't say you won't do other things, but let us say in West Africa, three or four things, cocoa, mm. uh, uh, maize, rice, and maybe cassava. Mm. Um, poultry will be our livestock, um, not too much of cattle. Um, let's leave cattle and um, milk um, or, or beef and milk to Southern Africa and East Africa, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But I believe that where we are now uh, is right, but it's not there. We are not there. And there's no earthly reason why we should be spending $40 billion a year mm. on importation of food. Absolutely. It no. is no, it's, it's unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, in, in view of the comments from His Excellency Obasanjo, who it takes six, took six years to get a loan. I don't know what that means for the rest of us, let alone young people, etc. Uh, can I ask the bankers in the room to put their hands up? <laughs> bankers, Abdul they Majid, will. we know. <laughs> Where are the rest? <laughs> and asking, they, please, they, we they. need solutions to affordable access to finance. It, it, it's got to make sense. Your Excellency, I see you want to jump in. Please, let me yeah, ask you. I, I wanted to do so because I think that uh, President Basanjo, as usual, has hit the nail on the head in identifying financing as a major roadblock, obstacle. Um, it's been one of the biggest challenges of my government, how to be able to shift the flow of resources in the banking system from investing in paper, in, in, in industry, and supporting the agricultural sector or the agribusiness mm -hmm. sector. And it has not been easy. Mm -hmm. And it continues to be difficult because obviously the, the risks uh, attendant on financing agricultural activity, they have the, it has its own risk. And we have not devised sufficiently well the instruments in our country that would enable the banking system to be able to focus on that. Mm -hmm. But I think focusing on that is absolutely critical. I mean, here in Ghana, I mean, this is a country that has been built by farmers, specifically cocoa farmers. Mm -hmm. So we understand what the whole value chain of agriculture means. Um, the whole of the last century, development in, of Ghana has been financed by the cocoa sector, essentially. Yes, the mining sector is also significant, but essentially it has been the cocoa sector that has brought us to where we are. So finding the solution and how we can generate the resources to support agribusiness in our country, I think is a major challenge confronting us. Since we've been in office, we have had to turn to a system of subsidies of our, of our farmers, largely because of this gap of financing. The subsidies have had to come from public resources, and that is this whole program we have called the Planting for Food and Jobs, where we have subsidized our smallholder farmers, because Ghanaian agriculture, like Agriculture in many parts of the continent is essentially smallholder farmers. We don't have huge plantations here, etc. Is to have finance uh, providing subsidies for the imports, seedlings, uh, fertilizer. That has been the, the, 
the pattern of our government. And it has, it has yielded some positive results, no two ways about it. We have seen that even during this difficult time in the COVID thing, the supply of foodstuffs to the markets, the availability of foodstuffs in the Ghanaian market has not been an issue. It isn't as if in this period of difficulty, we have also witnessed shortages of foods, etc. On the contrary, uh, access to to, to, to foods has been one of the, the, the more robust responses that our economy has had. And it's largely because the system that we had to put in place has been relatively successful. But clearly, there is a limit to how far we can go down that road of, of public subsidy for agriculture. And we need to look very, very seriously at, the post, at how we can develop another financial ecosystem that will enable resources to be channeled into the financing of agribusiness. And I think I would like very much to support the comments that President Obasanjo has made in this respect. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. When I come back to you, Wamkele, we'll go into this issue around access to finance and how to build financial ecosystems that make sense and can enable. Uh, let me come, quickly come to you, um, Your Excellency Kikwete, and uh, really looking at the opportunities and the challenges. And I met with some young people here in Ghana that we, 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 have, we have trained and partnered with, and, uh, you know, very interesting. All of them were in the ag sector. Some of them had stories of startup failure initially. One young man uh, realized that his business in livestock wasn't working, but he realized what is needed here is feed for the livestock. And I can go into that business. And then he went in, and now he's doing that, and they're figuring it out. And being inclusive when it comes to young people, when it comes to smallholder farmers, when it comes to the most vulnerable, what must we do to make sure that the Africa continental free trade area works for them? Because we know, even with women, these tend to the be the people on the ground who will be doing the work in the agricultural sector. Are we looking at that intentionally? And if so, what are we doing to enable them? Let me first uh, comment on, on the issue of financing for the agricultural sector. Mm -hmm. I'm an agricultural economist. Then I have passion for agriculture. So when I became Minister of Finance, I went to a meeting of um, the annual meeting of the banking. At that time, we had only one bank, the National Bank of Commerce. And I was speaking to them at the annual meeting, and the managing director then, I think Kamuzora, I spoke about extending loan to the agricultural sector. They listened to me attentively. I thought they had heard me. But after my speech, when, when I was being escorted out by the managing director, he says, Minister, forget about giving loans to agriculture. The argument is, it is too risky. So. Then when I became president, of course, before me, my, my predecessor, President Mkapa, created what President Nana is talking about, input subsidy to farmers. Because farmers need input. See, you cannot transform Africa's agriculture if we continue to use the handhold, if we, we continue to use traditional seeds, if we don't use fertilizers, if we don't irrigate, if you don't use herbicides and pesticides. So there was this crop subsidy. I trebled the amount of money for, for, for this program. But then what I saw was that the farmers are so many, and we cannot always raise enough money to give the farmers the subsidy and inputs to the size of the farms that they, that, that they grow. Somebody has 10 acres, you cannot support all of them. If somebody has 50 acres, we would do a one or two acres, and that was, a, was not enough to really take people out of, out of poverty and ensure food security. So I came up with the idea of uh, establishing the Agricultural Development Bank. I think the leadership is here with us, so that 
at some point we should transit from the concept of, of subsidies to get to a financial institution that is going to extend loan to farmers. Where it takes time to build it, uh, I'm not sure how far they are now. Um, I'm out of office for the last six now, it's close to seven years. But this, this is, this is one, one of the interventions. We created a system of savings and credit societies, SACOS, to encourage farmers to come up with this currently. So that the, the other problem the farmers have is that of collateral. They go to a bank, get a loan, and say, fine, what is the collateral? If you don't pay, you guys, what are we going to sell? And the poor farmers with these mud huts, thatch, thatch, thatch roofs, <laughs> the, the banks will not say, this cannot be used as a collateral. So <clears throat> we said, OK, fine, let's have the savings and credit societies in the rural areas, mm -hmm. where it is this society that is going to borrow money from the bank, and they're the ones who are going to guarantee for online to farmers. And because they are their farmers, they are going to. Of course, some of them, the repayment period has been, the, the repayment rate has been quite, 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 quite substantial. Mm -hmm. In fact, they threw their circles. There, there, is a, a lot, there, there is a lot of good payment of, of, of the loans because it is them in the village, their own society, they know Kikweta has borrowed so much, they, they breathe on his neck to repay the loan. But we are not doing enough. So how to build, how to make the CRDB of uh, Abdul Sekela and uh, there are the, the NBC guys there, uh, the TADB, how to to create a huge loan portfolio from the banks so that we can support the smallholder farmer has always been, been one of those challenges. Of course, there are a number of initiatives, but we have to continue to, 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 to work on that. Well, what was your question? My other question was <laughs> inclusivity. 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 Yes. Okay, inclusivity. Especially young people, women, yeah. smallholders. Yeah, it's the same, because if you cannot have credit facilities, credit lines where young people, women, can access loans, there, 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 there is no way. Yeah. So the financial sector, a level of flexibility, I'm not sure if, if they would agree, but the level of flexibility. The conditionalities for loans, this is what the, the young people are saying. Mm. You're asking me for collateral. I've just finished university. What can I have as collateral <laughs> to get a loan? Mm. But of course, to ask the bank also, lend them without collateral. I think this, this is where we, we, we need to find, we have to be innovative yeah. so that these young people, they, you have an incubation, you incubate them, they come up with ideas. After they have finished those ideas, you, 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 you need somebody to mentor them. Mm. But, but the, at the end of the day, you, you, you need, they need money as, as a venture capital that they're going to use so that they can translate their ideas mm -hmm. into, into something tangible. Mm -hmm. This is where we have not yet been very successful. And if we can really unlock that one, we will, have, we will, we will be able to do much better. Thank you. Thank you for that. Madam, and I think... Uh, Madam, uh, can I, yes, can I just... Um, yes. Well, um, this is to take on the point that uh, President Obasa just said about cocoa. Mm -hmm. We are the second largest producers of cocoa in the world in Ghana, mm -hmm. after the, our neighbor Cote d'Ivoire. And historically, the problem has been that uh, the, the entire value chain of the cocoa uh, output is developed outside our country. You talked about Switzerland and Germany, et cetera. There are encouraging signs in Ghana because we are now seeing some young Ghanaian entrepreneurs who are going into the development of the cocoa industry. We have a company, for instance, called Niche here in Ghana, mm -hmm. which has gone so far as to establish an American outlet whereby Ghanaian cocoa is now being used to produce chocolate in America right. by a Ghanaian company. Mm -hmm. Now, these are some of the developments that are taking place that we have to find a way of encouraging and making sure that they become, the, the, not the exception, but the, the norm in the development of the cocoa industry. 
I mean, something like 40% of Ghanaian our output is now processed locally. But the, the step from there to the higher levels in the value chain of the cocoa industry is still not there. Mm -hmm. But I'm encouraged by the fact that you have young entrepreneurs like the owners of the niche who are now today prepared to take that step of producing chocolate here, but doing so for the Ghanaian market, and are now have had the courage to say that they will establish facilities in the United States to produce cocoa over there. So some development and evolution is taking place, which is also quite positive, and we need to accentuate that and, pro and support that development. Right, to support that, to grow that. Um, it, it's such a sense of pride when we see our own Africans doing this on the continent, incredible that they're doing it um, in the US as well, but we are a fast growing population and so we will consume this, we will consume this. Yes, Your Excellency, I see your hand. And then well, we'll uh, come thank you, I just want to <clears throat> underpin the point made by uh, President Nana. The total uh, cocoa industry in the world is one, about $132 billion about $132 billion. The cocoa farmers, who are the key, what comes to them mm -hmm. is, is less than, you know, it's $9 billion. $9 billion go to cocoa farmers, those who toil night and day, and the rest, over, almost over $120 billion, goes to the processors. Mm -hmm. These, uh, those who store cocoa, those who transport cocoa, those who um, uh, carry cocoa in the, uh, in the, in, in, on, on their ships. Mm -hmm. So it is delightful to hear that Ghana is produce, uh, processing up to 40%. When I was president, we had a cocoa summit. The price of cocoa is, fi is fixed in London. London doesn't produce a grain of cocoa. Mm. Now, and we found that we could, in West Africa, fix the price of cocoa if we can process and keep our cocoa for one year. Just keep, be able to process mm. and keep for one year. Right. We will be able to de determine the price of cocoa in West Africa that we have not been able to do that. Maybe when Ghana is put, uh, processing 75% or 80% and Cote d'Ivoire is doing the same, we will be able to determine the price of cocoa. I just want to say that. Excellent. Uh, Wamkele, I had said to you, you know, I'm gonna come to you with the roadblocks. <laughs> Clearly, we are hearing the roadblocks, we're seeing them. And how are you trying to tap into solutions for this, um, access to finance, to ensuring that Africa is able to determine the pricing on some of its, um, its raw materials, to enable the manufacturing. Walk us through these, and I know you do have, you know, you've developed a youth protocol, a women protocol, so the issue of inclusivity as well. Take us through some of these things, please. Well, thank you very much. I, I think the, what's, what's clear is that the easiest part is, um, negotiating the rules that will enable the trade uh, to happen. What's more difficult is um, trade finance mm. and uh, establishing the supply chain networks that will enable the goods to move across borders. If I may start with, I mean, uh, the presidents have, 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 um, have spoken about the cost of trade finance. So if we succeed, which I do believe we will, to reduce and eliminate the legal barriers to trade, mm -hmm. um, how do we make sure that the smallholder farmers benefit from a larger market? We, we are negotiating a protocol on women and youth in trade. Um, uh, uh, Mama uh, President uh, uh, Samia Suluhu Hassan hosted us last year mm -hmm. in Dar es Salaam. Uh, to discuss exactly how we can eliminate these barriers. Our banks, our development finance institutions, uh, African Development Bank, Africa Finance Corporation, Trade and Development Bank of Africa, 
uh, and Africa Bank. The big question we should be putting to them, which we are, is how do you avail your balance sheet to make sure that the de-risking happens um, for the, 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 the smallholder farmers that the presidents uh, spoke about? Uh, how can they bring their capital um, to support local banks to reduce the cost of money, uh, to support commercial banks locally in every country or district mm -hmm. so that the local banks or cooperative banks uh, can, can make uh, trade finance uh, uh, affordable for cross-border trade. Mm -hmm. Because until we address this question of access to finance, we will succeed in reducing and eliminating the legal barriers. The market will be open but the goods will not flow because uh, the, the, um, the access is, uh, is not there to finance. The second challenge, which again we are addressing, is how do we establish these supply chain networks to enable the beef to move from Botswana to West Africa? Uh, Ugandan milk uh, to move from Uganda to North Africa. Uh, the, chocolate to move from uh, West Africa to Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. So the, the supply chain networks that uh, have to be established to enable that trade uh, to happen are critical. Many, many countries in West Africa um, uh, import uh, because of global trade rules. It's cheaper to import beef from another part of the world than, uh, let's say, from Botswana because of, of subsidies uh, that distort global markets, uh, particularly in cotton and so on. But even if we were to address that question, we would still need to make sure that the supply chain networks enable Ugandan milk, 200 billion liters of excess milk mm -hmm. to move from Uganda to Nigeria. We'd still be able to make sure uh, that the, the wheat moves from Ethiopia to Egypt and so on. So we have to, to take additional steps to make sure that this trade becomes a reality. And, and that's, that's where our development finance institutions uh, come in. That's where we have to work with our airline industry uh, to make sure that we have these supply chain networks. Um, otherwise, we will forever be importing from other parts of the world because it's easier to do so because those products are subsidized. Right, right, thank you for that. Your Excellencies, I'm gonna come in almost a quick fire round to each of you on my next question. Uh, starting with you, Your Excellency Haile Mariam Dessalen. The reality of the world today is that uh, we are in an incredibly dynamic time. And um, there are a lot of pressures, global pressures in many different ways. And Africa is well positioned and we have a lot of people coming because of the, the dynamics, pulling us in one direction or another and pulling us away from our dream of this united, uh, you know, uh, open, uh, open continent. How do we navigate through this current season we are in to ensure that we're not going into an economic scramble for Africa? where we get dazzled by things being offered here or there and do not pay attention to our Africa continental free trade areas and our opportunities to build up ourselves together. Um, Tessalan, please, would you start us off? I think um, there is a need for political leadership and political will. I think that's a key. We can't bypass that. So our leaders has to come up that united, we are strong. And so I think this is, this is the basis. Uh, beyond that, uh, there are practical measures we have to take. Mm -hmm. Now we have to make uh, Africa integrated in terms of infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure is very essential and um, we have to come together. We have programs like a uh, program for infrastructure development in Africa. We call it PIDA, which is an African uh, union program. Mm -hmm. We have to expedite the implementation of that. Mm -hmm. I think we can do that uh, with multilateral financial institutions involved in it. As the Secretary General was mentioning, mm -hmm. we need to have a 
the ability to move commodities uh, from one part of Africa to the other. There is, you know, good sign, ECOWAS, ECA, the, you know, um, the East African community, EAC, they are doing a very good job. I think that regional integration can help us to connect together all those dots which are not connected. Okay. I think this is important. But let me say something about the Tanzanian program on inclusion. Uh, you know, President Samia has introduced a youth agricultural uh, e engagement program. They call it Building a Better Future, the BBAI. So I think that program is designed intentionally to bring the youth into agriculture, making agriculture attractive to the young people. Digitally driven, uh, land allocated, financial inclusion is there, uh, technological support is provided. So these kind of intentional programs are important. They wanted every um, in institutions, uh, be it bilateral or multilateral institutions, supporting Tanzanian programs to gear towards the inclusion program. I think that kind of program is exemplary has to be you know, expanded in our continent. So that brings the, the extent of young private sector engagement. I think in our continent, private dynamism, private sector dynamism is essential. We have to do that as much as possible. Even in infrastructure development, there are a number of African private sectors that come together along with other global uh, infrastructure developers in a private sector if we make the business working environment conducive for this kind of uh, private dynamism to happen in our continent. So there are a number of solutions that are uh, already existing, but what needs is political will and political leadership to achieve this uh, situation because there is a clarion call now uh, because of the global dynamism Africa is at receiving end, and we need to, to do that as quickly as possible. There is a sense of urgency yes. at this level. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Your Excellency, <coughs> President Obasanjo, the same question to you, please. Thank you very much. Um, I will go uh, to what um, the two speakers before me on this have, uh, what, what, what the, point, the point they have made. Um, the Executive Secretary of the uh, African uh, Free Trade uh, Agreement talk about the uh, banks. I, I believe you need to get those three continental um, development banks, the Africa Development Bank, AFRECLIM and uh, AFC, mm -hmm. together with the governors of our federal banks to talk about this, mm -hmm. they can find solutions. Right. I have no doubt about right. that. Um, we tried something before in Nigeria. Uh, we did not continue it. We, we call it a Greek guarantee scheme. Mm -hmm. um, the central bank guarantees a loan up to 75% given for agriculture. And if that loan goes bad, Central Bank will pay you 75% of the loan. Mm -hmm. and, and it worked. Um, it, has not con uh, it has not been uh, continued. I don't know uh, what happened to it when I left government. But, but that's one thing. I, I want to come to what uh, uh, Prime Minister Hel Meriam said about political will. Mm -hmm. um, I like political will but I like political will with political action. Um, there may be political will without political Can action. Can we give that a round of applause? <laughs> there may be political will without political action. We feel amount to abortion, and we don't want abortion. We want uh, a child to be developed in the womb to be de uh, and to be born and to grow up, that's what political will and political action is all about. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that 
our leaders. And then we can see the example in the African free trade, uh, uh, continental free trade uh, agreement itself. Now, in a space of three years, we have got how many people, how many countries have now? 47. 47 mm -hmm. out of 54. Wow. Uh, is, I believe it's unprecedented uh, presented in the uh, annals of uh, African political uh, uh, action. Uh, so it can be done. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it, it just to get up, maybe uh, at, the national, uh, at the continental level, and then take it down to regional economic uh, unit uh, level. Um, and and, and, and I, I believe uh, that is what we have to do. But we have no choice. Yeah. Now, the, the, the point you are making is that, look, how do we make sure that um, we are not uh, divided between this and that? Um, it's their own interest to divide us. And, and, and we, shouldn't deny, we, we shouldn't just uh, bury our head in the sand. It's their interest to divide us. Now, we, would, we need what they want. And if we don't get what we have, uh, they want it. And if they can get it free, they will get it free. If they can get it by dividing us, they will, get, they will divide us and get it. If they can get it even by eliminating us, they will eliminate us and get it. Now, if, that, if we understand that, it is now up to us to guard what we have. Now, we have 70% uh, of the co cobalt in the world, in, in two countries in Africa. And the world, when you talk of battery and uh, for whatever we are talking for cars and all that, this is an essential. Now, why should they fold their arms and, and leave it to us if they need it, and they need it. So what are we doing about it mm. to preserve that co collectively in Africa? What are our development banks doing about it to make sure that this, which is um, in, uh, a material that the world needs, particularly the developed world, and that we take it as something that we can guard and make available to the world in our own terms, on our yes. own terms, rather than let them take it from us. The Chinese have, uh, they, they have their military interested in this, um, and, and the West have their industries in, interested in this. We should know that, and we should make sure that we do something about it not that they force it on us. Um, I went to Turkey once, and being a poultry farmer, I was in Ankara, and I said, look, is there any poultry uh, farm around? Oh, they say well, there's one about one hour, 15 minutes from Ankara, and I went there. Mm -hmm. This is a poultry farm. It produces one million eggs a day, wow. one million eggs a day and only 15 people are working there. It's almost completely, totally automated. And I asked the uh, owner, I said, how much did this cost you? He said a little bit of uh, $40 million. And 50% of it was grant. 50% of it, according to him, was grant. And what does he want? He wants to start exporting eggs to Nigeria, I say, not on your life. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, where was this, where was this In from? Turkey. In, in Turkey. Turkey. Yeah, in Turkey, yeah, in Turkey. Okay. Near is uh, about one hour, 15 minutes to Ankara. Yeah. I, I don't know. But I went there, I just wanted to, I say, not on your life. Not now, but the point life. is this, yes. <laughs> there is no Nigerian poultry farmer producing eggs that will be able to compete with him. Yes. Because we don't get any uh, grant. He got 50% grant to start and to produce. So that is the sort of thing that we should understand and that our own leaders too should understand yes. and be able to say, look, if this is the problem, 
how do we confront it? Right, and bringing together, for instance, the yeah. development banks yeah. into a strategic, yeah. intentional conversation to solve that. Um, we don't have much time. President Kikwete and then President Nana Kufuado, I want to come to both of you with that question around how does Africa remain focused on Africa's agenda and not um, dazzled <laughs> by, please, please, I, thank you, sir. Right. Yes. Let me start. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me start, and the president has the final word. Yes, thank you. Well, I, I think it's, it's a question of decision on the part of the leaders. Mm -hmm. They will always try to, to drag you. The, there was a time somebody was asking me, uh, is Africa supporting Ukraine? I said, I'm not president. <laughs> but, but the point I'm saying is, and somebody else at one point was asking me a question. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm on a program at Harvard University, a Harvard Leadership Ministerial Program, and we are, and that time, the, the issue had just started in Ukraine, and somebody was asking me, but is Africa supporting Ukraine? I said, well, I don't know. I'm not a leader, but what I've seen is that when the, when the, when the crisis started, when people were being evacuated, boarding on the trains, they were throwing away Africans who, who are in Ukraine. So do you, do you expect under those circumstances really Africa would be, would be amused? And they said, but hasn't, hasn't the president apologized for this? I said, I don't know. I'm not in government. So uh, there are times when it is the issues, they want us to support them. But when it is our issues, they don't care about it. So. This, 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 is, this is precisely the point where we have to know what are issues of our interest to us, and if this interest coincide with their interest, then that's fine. But if, if, if they don't, we should not be forced to, to abandon our interest in favor of their interest. I think that, that, that is suicidal. And, and that will, will, will not take us anywhere. And uh, for this thing is one thing that I've, I always compliment <coughs> President Nana here for being quite strong, from tell, for telling it as it is. Yes, and you know when you stand with Macron and, uh, <coughs> and tell him what, what you told him, I, I, I honestly admire you. Uh, please. <laughs> Now, now, when you finish, I just want to say something about that. Yes. You see, the world out there will respect us when we stand firm, we stand together, and we stand strong. And that is what President Nana had done to say, look, this is our interest. And they, 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 will, they will also respect us when we respect ourselves. Part of the problem, too, is that at times we don't respect ourselves. We must learn to respect ourselves. Thank you. He has said it all. Thank you. President, President Akubo, yeah, please. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a British statesman some time ago in the 19th century who made the statement that his country doesn't have permanent friends. It only has permanent interests. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the philosophy that should guide us. Mm -hmm. That we don't have permanent friends. We have permanent interests, which is about what we want in the world. And that our response to everybody is guided by what we want in the world. Mm -hmm. How we see our own development how we can assert more control over our own resources, 
how we can develop the societies that we want. And if, we are, if our mindset is there, that what matters for us are our interests, the rest finds its, its, its way of, 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 of fitting in. And, of, right? and I'm, I've always been guided by that statement. Mm -hmm. We don't have permanent friends. Yeah. We have permanent, permanent interests. interests. Right. And it is those permanent interests that we should be pushing and advocating, advancing all the Thank time. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. As we close, just very, very quickly, I want us to make a commitment to each of us. How are we going to advance the agenda? We probably are already deep in the space, but what commitment can we make to the continent moving forward? Um, I will start as an African. And as part of the MasterCard Foundation, our mission is to see 30 million young Africans in dignified work by 2030. We are working with the Africa Continental Free Trade Area on various different fronts. We're working with organizations like AGRA at the Pan-African level, various different things happening. At country level, we are training young people. We are looking at access to finance. We will continue in that space to do those things. And we will give voice to those who are voiceless, the young people women, young women, and the smallholder farmers. Wamkele, what are you committing to? You are marshalling the troops. You are leading this journey. What commitment do you make to Africa? Well, I, we, we continue, and I personally continue to be committed to commercially meaningful integration in Africa. The political integration, I believe, is, is, is there, but commercially meaningful integration is uh, a commitment that uh, uh, has to drive the implementation of the AFCFTA. Mm -hmm. If you consider the fact that 72 years ago, uh, the European Union started with five countries, five or six countries, under the, the then European Coal and Steel Pact. And today it is singularly the most competitive economic integration model in the world mm. with a, um, a single uh, monetary union. This is something that our forebears, as His Excellency President Akufuado said, envisaged seven decades ago. Mm -hmm. So we have, to, we have to remain on this path of integration. It is going to be difficult. It is going to be daunting. Uh, there may, at times, be temptations to withdraw and look inward at national interests, but we have to remain on the path, and I, I think the, the presidents have said it all, that we are not yet there, but we are on the path. We've started the journey, and I am very privileged to be part of uh, that journey and to stand on their shoulders to stand on their shoulders right. to continue the journey. Right, excellent. Your Excellency, thank you. Halimaria Dasalem, your commitment to Africa. You also are in this space. What's your commitment as you move forward? Yeah, um, I think if we have to learn from history, then I think the more balkanized we are, uh, we cannot succeed in the global competition. So Africa has to come together and I think uh, this is a big opportunity for us uh, in the African continental free trade area uh, to be implemented uh, with its uh, letter and spirit. But we need to have something to be tradable. Mm. Uh, otherwise, uh, we cannot achieve that. So we need to build our productive capacity. Mm. I want to focus time and again Without that productive capacity in our continent, it becomes a wishful thinking. So we need to have that, and we have to gear all our policies, programs, and uh, the Baba say the political action. I also said political leadership, Baba. But in any case, I think that's very essential, and uh, we hope we can achieve that, and we need uh, that commitment. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Baba, what do you say? What is your commitment moving forward? I believe that um, leadership is essential. I believe 
in what Reverend Nana said, what is our interest? And if we know our interest, how can we protect and guard our interest? Mm -hmm. That is very, very important. And not just individually, but collectively as a continent. Um, the good old uh, uh, saying is that if you want to walk fast, go alone. Mm. But if you want to go far, uh, go far, go together. Go together. Mm. I believe we have to go fast and go together. Uh, we have to go fast and we have to go far. So no. the, the, the challenge is real. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, we have to go far and we have to go fast. Exactly. Because we cannot afford to be left behind. Um, I am a very great believer in our youth. Yes, thank you. And the future and the present. I always say to youth, don't listen to anybody who says the future belongs to you. If you don't take care of the present, you won't have the future which they say belongs to you because they will have ruined it. They will have ruined it for you and you won't have the future. Um, and we are a continent of youth. Yes. yes. And if we are a continent of youth, we must really treat our youth. Take my own country. 20 million children that should be in school are not in school. Out of 240 or so in the world. So we have 10% of children that should be in school mm -hmm. that are not in school in the world. Now, what future do we have for those children? And if you are worried about Boko Haram today, now those are Boko Haram of tomorrow. You don't need uh, to, for anybody to tell you that, well, those will be liability tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So we must really take care of today so that tomorrow can take care of itself. Powerful, powerful. Thank you so much. Your Excellency Kikwete, your commitments moving forward. My commitment, I'm a believer in, uh, in integration. Mm -hmm. I've worked for the, for the East African Community Integration, Southern Africa. I was part of the working on the constitutive act of the African Union. I hope, President, you were a foreign minister that time. Mm -hmm. Yes. We labored so much in safety. We resisted a lot of pressure. So, <laughs> so we blame you, foreign minister, for all the things that you did not do. <laughs> but, you know, we, 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 we had a tough time. Because at the beginning, the Libyan delegation came up with the, with the Libyan constitution as take it as the new constitutive act, we said no. <laughs> oh, we had a huge problem. We had a, we had a big fight until we, we came to that. But the point I'm saying is that, that I, I believe if we can drive the African integration agenda successfully, mm. everything else would be easy on the African continent. Of course, there is much more that is to be done, but if we can forge unity. I have that commitment. I'll continue along that path. Whatever I can do to advance the African integration agenda, I will definitely do. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. <laughs> Mr. President, your commitment and you have the final word. My so, commitment. I'm heading it. So yes. I can't be a personal <laughs> commitment. Uh, there's, a, there's an expression, a mantra we are using here in Ghana to define our future, that is to create a Ghana beyond aid. That continues to be the focus of all that we're trying to do here, to build a country which is resilient, which is self-reliant, and therefore is dependent on itself in terms of its 
development of human capital, the way in which it exploits its wealth, the way in which it builds on, on, its, on its population. It, it, all of these are being done within the context of a country that has a vision for its own development. And that vision feeds into the larger African vision of the, of the un, United con Continent. We have a lot to do with the whole Pan-African idea. Our first leader was one of the most articulate promoters of the idea, and it is something that is now part and parcel of the Ghanaian political fabric. So moving to on that and making sure that, indeed, we can arrive at that goal, that's a major commitment. And of, and of thank myself. you. Thank you for that. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, in the land of Kwame Nkrumah, I feel optimistic. Thank you. I feel we can do this. I feel that our youth, our continent, our people have the energy and we can transform and bring to life this integrated agenda. And with agriculture, it means a transformation of our countries and, and our continent in a powerful way. A big thank you to this panel. Please, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, and Dr. Chulu Gichiru and their excellencies. Respectfully, I shall indulge you for quick photo opportunities. We shall have two of them. First, with all the members of the panel. Doc, let's have you in the middle together with your excellencies. <laughs>